Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to our next CTO roundtable session. Um, today we're going to discuss a very special case. Uh, we're going to talk about Picnic. Um, good to see so many of you uh, here. Uh, can you? Uh, normally we would ask, can you give me a hi or a wave? But let's do something else today. Let's. Um, can you write in the chat window the country where you're connected? Let's see if we have people in the, uh, in the session. Poland, Netherlands, Holland, Netherlands, Netherlands. Okay, a lot, lot of people from the Netherlands. Belgium, the Netherlands. Very good. Welcome, so, Netherlands. Welcome, Poland. Welcome, uh, Belgium. Yep, very good. So thank you for that. And um, I'm sure we'll, uh, we'll get some people from outside of Europe also, but uh, is a let, let's move on. So um, um, for people that don't know, Picnic Picnic is the um, world fastest growing online supermarket that uh, makes grocery shopping simple, fun and affordable for everyone. I like that headline. In 2019, it was the fastest growing company in the Netherlands and Picnic has over 350,000 customers and delivers in more than 125 cities in the Netherlands and Germany. Um, almost 5,000 employees, and they only started five years ago. Right? It's an incredible company and story. So, um, I'm Gerrit Arde Veldhuis, the CTO of Travelia and General Manager of the Software House in the Netherlands, and I will be your host today, but I'm really honored to be accompanied by uh, Daniel Gabler, the CTO from, uh, from Picnic. Um, Daniel, thanks for joining, uh, joining me today. Thanks, Gerbert, uh, for having me. Thanks, everybody out there. Very good. Yeah. Okay. And um, with us also, uh, Marek, Marek Gatja, the CTO of Software House, and Marek will help us with all of your questions. Um, please note that we would like to ask as you to ask as many questions as you want. Uh, you should really take this opportunity to ask questions to Daniel, and um, we'll try to answer as many questions as possible, but if we don't get everything done, then uh, we'll try to get back to you after the call. Um, if you ask a question, please do that in the Q&A tab, um, not in the chat window. We'll uh, monitor the Q&A uh, tab and um, we'll take questions during and after the session. So uh, let's start. So Daniel, can you give a short introduction about yourself? Yes, so let's keep it short and simple. So my name is Daniel, I'm the CTO of Picnic. Uh, you already gave a bit of an introduction, but uh, uh, um, our mission is very simple, to so make grocery shopping uh, simple, fun, and affordable for everyone. Our journey started uh, five years ago in a very small kind of garage-type startup setting, where we uh, embarked on a journey to make a grocery shopping a, a fundamentally new experience. And by now, um, now, we are now active, actually, in a little bit more than 100 cities here in Netherlands have more than half a million customers. And in Germany, we are active now since two years, where we have already uh, more than 100,000 customers and are also active in uh, a few dozen cities. So that is a bit our journey so far. I, myself, uh, came to Netherlands a little bit earlier, did my PhD here, like the country, like the people, stay. <laughs> That's always good. Okay, so um, the um, I know that these last few months since um, the COVID outbreak have been quite extreme for you and your team, um, like for many people, of course. But uh, can you give us some insight in the effect that COVID had on the day-to-day -day business at Picnic? Yeah. So um, obviously, the last months have been uh, for nobody, both in tech and in business, uh, a normal time. So for us, we call this business as unusual. And what means unusual, if you go to the next slide, then uh, the event that made it un uh, unusual, uh, Gabriel, if you can go to the next slide, then um, the COVID, uh, let's say the COVID uh, virus uh, that hit the world made uh, basically every business plan uh, that we all had at the beginning of the year obsolete. And everybody had to rethink how to act and react in such a time. So what it meant for food and in general for delivery, that online food exploded. And if you go to the next slide, you will see a little bit on what we see on our side. You see now a graph, which is showing at the uh, search terms for the term online Boatschappen, which is Dutch for online groceries on Google. 
And then Google, you see here, here until around early March, search, search was roughly on a, on a similar level. So there's no big difference. And then basically around mid to March is exploded massively. And by now, obviously, it, things are starting to normalize a bit again, but it is on a much very, very, very different level than it had been before. So what does it mean if everybody moves from a physical retail to online retail for various reasons? Some people didn't feel safe to go to, to a physical supermarket. Some people didn't want, some people didn't, couldn't. Some people had uh, just uh, family members that have been in a danger, uh, let's say in the, uh, in the age range where it was a bit more dangerous. So if you look to our services on the next slide, you will see a bit how our normal, um, our normal server behavior looks like. So people in the picnic app are starting typically to shop in the morning between somewhere around six and seven, and then you see basically flat demand until around 10 o'clock in the evening, and then everybody goes to bed. So on the y-axis, you have then a couple of, uh, a couple of thousand customers at the same time in the picnic app. So what happened then between February and March, this behavior drastically changed. And on the next slide, you will see that now customers came in large quantities to our, uh, to our site, to our app, in the morning at nine. So now the question is, why, do, why does everybody come at nine? What happens at nine o'clock is that new capacity became available. So customers could again place an order in a week's time. So we had all delivery capacity already booked out. And then at nine o'clock, customers could uh, order for a new moment where they could uh, actually shop uh, on our, in our app. So that was meant also for all the capacity, both front and then back end capacity, that the typical behavior was not only 10, 20, 30% higher, not two, three X, no, also not five X, not 10 X, it was 15, sometimes even higher, 20 X, uh, the same demand as uh, what we have seen earlier. So that mean, meant that we had to scale up basically all capacities, meaning uh, the app capacity, the backend capacities, the database capacity, both uh, Postgres and MongoDB. And that meant also set all kind of auto scaling behavior that old classical uh, cloud vendor are offering have been also significantly changed. So what we learned in this period is that everybody talks about resilience, everybody talks about auto scaling, but for a situation like COVID, nobody has been prepared. There's no AWS, no Google, no Azure, nobody was prepared for this kind of peak demand. And everybody had to build new tools to cope with this kind of huge spikes in demand and a new behavior from customers. Yeah, yeah. This is incredible. This is not, uh, you know, 30% growth, which uh, many companies will already be very happy with, but this is, you know, 15x that is amazing. Think about uh, this is 15x in just a couple of days. Most companies are happy if they can report week or uh, year over year that they do 10, 20, 30%. Yeah. In this term, 1.3x. Yeah. Yeah. 15x is uh, 1,500%. Uh, yeah, no, indeed so. Okay, so um, um, I'm sure that uh, many CTOs and tech leaders in today's call um, that now uh, might think, you know, what will happen if my system suddenly gets 15x growth in years? And uh, how did they get ready for that? If there's it's every CTO's nightmare, I would say, that, you know, you see um, such a growth, finally, you know, growth is there and then you're not ready for that. Um, so that's what we're going to focus on today. And let's start at the uh, beginning, I would say. So um, can you explain the scope of, of the role of the CTO in, uh, in Picnic a little bit? So in a young startups, let's scale up, then uh, the role of the CTO is certainly changing and evolving over time. In the yeah. early days, the role of the CTO is more like a senior developer or a senior engineer. It evolves over time and then more in an architectural role. And then at time, you also take people and product responsibilities. But in essence, every uh, three to six months, the role is fundamentally changing. And if you're looking back, then uh, we started uh, at the beginning uh, with a role that was very much centered around uh, one Scrum team and uh, leading uh, towards building a very first MEP-like solution uh, that we could bring live. And now it is a team of around 150 engineers organized in 15 product teams that are covering uh, uh, essentially the entire breadth of the supply chain, meaning yeah. purchasing products, fulfillment, distribution, uh, route planning, uh, buying, etc. Okay, okay. So 
if you if you would give an advice to leaders in technology companies that want to become a CTO, what what would be your advice? Uh, you know, thinking about your colleagues today at the Certainly, certainly. So um, it's not that easy to give really uh, uh, valuable advice, but let me let me give it a, uh, a try. So probably uh, from a more high level angle, you should always stay curious, stay open minded, and don't take yourself uh, too serious. Your role moves from an engineer to engineer lead uh, to a, a role where you are more kind of a divisionary for your tech stack and for your product stack, and you're reaching out uh, or you're basically sketching. Uh, the future, how the future of your company can look like, and also the path, how you can uh, reach this. But on the other hand, you should also stay very much hands-on. So you still should do some engineering, you should still build systems, and you don't have enough time. So obviously you can't do a, all kind of uh, production uh, critical code, but you should still do quite a bit of uh, development. And beside that, you should always also stay close to very much the business, the tech side, and also your engineering peers uh, from other companies. To get yeah. fresh input about uh, how to uh, how your role should evolve further. So, do you still find the time to do some hands-on? So, um, I have have been doing a, quite a bit of development uh, a couple of years back. So, I built a large part of the analytics infrastructure. We call this the dashboards, where you can see in real time uh, um, what is happening, uh, for instance, uh, on the road. So, what is happening in our fulfillment warehouses. Um, I'm probably less close to the code uh, by now, but I still try to uh, find a little bit of time left and right to do uh, some engineering and also to follow basically the latest trends about react, uh, react, reactive programming and all the kind of new trends that everybody is raving about to form also an opinion. Can this be the right thing for Picnic and for the industry? Yeah, good. Interesting that you still <laughs> find time for that. So how, um, how many people do you have in your team and how did you organize that? I'm sure there's something special to it. So we have, we have started uh, in the beginning with a very, very small team. And a small team means uh, we had uh, just a couple of engineers, uh, which were run uh, as a scrum team. And this scrum team uh, had uh, just a simple mission of building an MVP. And uh, we had daily standups, weekly releases, and then at some point we put it live in 2015. Over time, uh, we built a couple of scrum teams and we had to rethink on how we structure uh, our tech organization. So by now, we are uh, around 150 engineers organized in product teams. And product teams means for us a cross-functional team that is led by a dual leadership team of a product owner. So this is a classical role of leading uh, the product from the business and the road mapping side, and then a tech lead. And uh, the tech leadership uh, of a product is something we are very proud of and what we find very, very important because tech lead itself is also defining half of the roadmap of a product to actually build a scalable solution, to build a more resilient solution, to build a solution that adopts the latest engineering principles that we come up with the architecture working group. So to make sure that we are not sticking with the tech stack that we had initially built up, but actually that we are also becoming a, a company of a tech stack of uh, 2020 or 2022 uh, down the road. Yeah. Most companies have the challenge that uh, once they are, uh, that they have the tech stack down the road of the year where they are stopped, they never get out of it. And we have a lot of very good examples here in Netherlands that are kind of plagued from, uh, from, from this observation. And we learned in our journey um, uh, that this is something what we need to early overcome and that we need to reinvent ourselves essentially every single year. Interesting, wow. So how autonomous are these teams uh, then? So what can they decide on their own and how do you set guidelines for them? So our design principle for the teams is to set, say start is fully autonomous or cross-functional team. So they can be uh, operate fully uh, autonomous as they define their roadmap, they define their product APIs, their product vision, and then they align it with their respective um, Respective business stakeholders. However, autonomy is something which is not never in a completely free or independent space. So some product teams are closer linked to a different kind of business teams. Let me give an example. A team that is building the app needs to work closely with a marketing team or an, a growth ops team to build basically uh, the right features for the growth operation or for the attention of, uh, of customers. Yeah. And then there are products that are linked to physical realities. An example for this is that uh, products that are, for instance, for the fulfillment operations. So fulfillment means basically the warehouse picking operation. 
needs to be closely aligned with the operation on the floor. So therefore, we can only release once per week. We need to align 5,000 people that are running those kind of products or that are uh, operating these products. And then our latest product or our latest project is building a fully robotized autonomous uh, warehouse. With, with such a project, you're building an entire new building with a lot of steel, with a lot of robots, with a lot of conveyor belts, where I need to uh, align uh, digital uh, development streams with all kind of uh, robotic uh, traceable uh, uh, building streams. And there you're running kind of a hybrid model between autonomous uh, scrum teams or product teams and then classical project management that need to, uh, need to run in a, in a very classical project management manner. Okay, so could you are these teams uh, self-managing, uh, self-managed teams, you could say? They are certainly uh, self-managed. So they are setting themselves uh, goals. They are running a uh, kind of the day-to-day -day processes completely themselves. They are reporting themselves. They are looking uh, for alignment with the different kind of stakeholders. But some kind of uh, bigger decisions are then uh, aligned more on a on a cost product or on a company-wide level where we align different kind of bigger streams and different bigger strategic decisions. Yeah. So, so do you see these self-managed teams as a solution for, you know, every development environment um, uh, or, or is it a place where it's less applicable or wouldn't work? Uh, how do you, what's your vision on that? So every organization and every environment needs to find its own kind of rhythm. And um, I know also organizations that can run a pretty effectively uh, without completely autonomous teams. However, um, what we try to do is everybody in Picnic has an uh, individual contributor role. Or to be more precise, we don't have pure facilitation roles. We don't have pure managerial roles. Okay. Which means, in practical terms, that everybody needs to be uh, concretely involved in a product and uh, needs to work in a self-steering manner. So as an example, if we have uh, 15 product teams with uh, 50 tech leads, 15 product owners, and all of them are reporting directly to me. But it means that I have direct, uh, 30 direct reports, which in practice means that those teams are running uh, just independently. Yeah. Nobody can have to, uh, 30, 30 direct reports and uh, uh, really to give enough attention to all of them. However, those teams are, uh, became so autonomous that they have a very, very strong vision, not only for the next uh, days, weeks, months, but they know also where they want to be and where Picnic will be in a couple of years' time. Yeah, so your role is alignment uh, more than, than and that is actually uh, this is the actual leadership leadership uh, kind of function of the cto where you think more about how do you want to have your organization and where you want to have your tech stack or your business operation yeah. in a couple of years time and then you basically guide the organization towards uh, a bit along this path yeah great so so let's let's talk a little bit about the deployments it's always a discussion about uh, so What's your philosophy on deployment? Is there a central team everything goes through or can everyone deploy to uh, production? Uh, you know, what, what, what's your view on that? Our philosophy is pretty simple. You build it, you own it, you run it. So, which means that every product team has uh, his build artifacts, they deploy whenever they feel ready uh, to deploy this to production. They decide themselves on uh, the deployment rhythm and say, also operated in a way that uh, the product stays stable, yeah. which means that uh, some products are deploying uh, multiple times per day. For instance, our consumer-facing products in the payment solutions are deploying multiple times per day, while, for instance, solutions that are, need to be aligned with larger operational teams are typically uh, deployed only once per week. For instance, our fulfillment solutions, um, our distribution solutions, our platform-related solutions uh, are more deployed on a weekly basis. Yeah, so that, that also sort of answers my next question where I, uh, you know, about accountability and um, so I always ask the question, who is being called out of bed if something goes wrong with a, with a software product? But the, that the team runs it, builds it, owns it, so I guess... Uh, the, first, the key principle and the key philosophy should be nobody. So the goal should be zero, zero <laughs> incidents. Obviously, in this agreement, we are all working in tech and we love tech and we know that uh, we have a couple of incidents, but it is very important that ownership of incidents, so meaning incident monitoring, incident management, incident resolution, incident prevention, uh, is with the team. If your team needs to handle uh, and gets called out in the night in an incident, then there's a very strong incentive 
to make actually the product tomorrow better since they are not getting pulled out uh, tomorrow night. Yeah. Therefore, that has been a pretty, a pretty powerful principle. There is obviously a little bit of a nuance to it where when you talk about um, shared infrastructure and then you have a team that takes care of the shared infrastructure, this is a team where we're looking more careful into giving them enough support that they are not uh, getting overwhelmed with incident management or incident monitoring type of uh, situations. Yeah, yeah, not very good. So uh, let's, um, Marek, um, um, do you um, have some questions from the audience, let's say? I'm here, yeah, I'm, I'm seeing what's happening in the chat. Thank you guys for, uh, for putting the, the questions. Uh, the first one is from Enzo Ferrey. Uh, the question is, what, the, what is the part of your architecture that suffered the most from this COVID spike? Uh, and uh, how did it look before and after after the growth? So what's the, yeah, what's the question? Yeah. What's the most? So this is actually a very good question. So thanks for asking this. Um, architecture itself. Um, so we have, we have started with an, um, we call this a meso service architecture, meaning it is not it was not really a monolithic architecture, but uh, it was a couple of uh, larger services, and we moved to microservices. And in such a micro, and even if you have microservices, um, if you don't go all in in the Netflix style, you still have a kind of a layered architecture. And we saw also basically the artifacts of a layered architecture, where you still have a kind of a, a business layer, application layer, and, and, and a data layer, and a kind of a backend layer, and where we saw the first incidents uh, happening more on the, on the application level, and we worked on a kind of auto scaling or scheduled scaling functionalities on Kubernetes level, both on the application level and the cluster level. And then the next level uh, that we need to, had to tackle is basically the database level. So we're working uh, with, uh, on the document database side with MongoDB and on the uh, uh, relational database side with Postgres, and we had to build up all kind of tools and kind of all kind of uh, database a logic we had to improve to cope with this kind of spiky demand. And the interesting one is while everybody in uh, the physical world is talking about flattening the curve, in a, in a digital world uh, talking about uh, software services, you can't really flatten the curve in that easy way. Obviously, you can catch and pull uh, uh, okay, catch and pull pipelines for for queries. But usually that is not really possible because that, that means only that you're building a bigger issue. So therefore, we had to build up all kind of additional changes around our the way how we uh, query MongoDB and uh, Postgres. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, the second question is actually from a little spoiler alert because this will be our guest uh, the, on the next CDO roundtable. It's uh, Jago Philippens. Uh, I'm not sure if I pronounce your name uh, right. So sorry for that. Uh, so Jago says, says uh, you mentioned you have to reinvent yourself every year. And how fundamental do you go on that? It's rather about structure of the teams or goals you are set or entire different things? So, actually, hi Jago. Um, this is actually a very good question because uh, reinventing means uh, you need to reinvent on three levels. So you really need to reinvent or grow yourself. You need to reinvent, grow uh, your team and the organization on the team. And you need to also develop further your organization itself. So, on uh, if you're talking about me uh, in the CTO role, then uh, I'm uh, typically um, touching base with uh, the tech leads, uh, trying to see how what do they need and how do uh, do I need to develop myself further and change the way how I'm uh, working with the team to be more valuable and more helpful for the team. So that meant, uh, for instance, that um, a couple of years back said more and more communication, uh, I had to take over more communication towards the business teams from the tech teams. While now the tech teams uh, and Picnic and all of the product teams are so strong on communicating to business teams and also to customers, so this is a part that they can take over themselves. But now it is uh, more on the ana analysis side. So I have taken over more analysis parts, for instance, on the traffic side, on the usage of systems, that uh, I'm picking up, which to uh, basically uh, ease the load on the on the product teams, and there is definitely, and that is something what I'm pretty sure is that uh, the tech teams will also cover in uh, in a couple of weeks and months time, and then uh, there is a kind of a new growth step also for myself to be uh, more valuable for the teams itself. Okay, thank you for that. And uh, the last question in this session, uh, uh, Walter Muller. Uh, 
says that uh, how do you create a good development culture? From what you have uh, said, it seems like uh, <clears throat> you have it figured out in a very good way. But in order to do that, you need to have like this very strong and good development culture in your company. And can you give some examples of decisions you made to achieve this? I'm not building the culture. I'm nurturing maybe the culture, but the first thing, culture starts with the right people. So when we are talking about a great culture and uh, let's say the right, the, the right way how we develop and operate systems, then it's the right engineer that uh, we have them picking. So uh, looking, at, so that means we are putting a lot of focus during our hiring process. Is there uh, everybody who joins the team, uh, does he has the right cultural and team fit? And when we're looking for culture and team fit, we are not so much looking at where he is now with his hard skills, but what we're looking into is where can this engineer be with the right environments in a year's time or three years time? Because we are hiring not somebody to be today or tomorrow the right engineer, but we are looking for somebody to be in a year's time or two years time the kind of the, the, the picnic is the right place for. So this is one thing. The other thing is giving a lot of freedom to the teams is something what uh, both teams appreciate and what uh, helps also the teams to grow. So therefore opening up enough uh, growth opportunities in the team is one of the key cultural elements that we have been, uh, have been using. And probably the third one is giving everybody on wherever he is in uh, his journey enough support. And that means also coaching, mentoring, HR support programs, also looking into if you don't have enough support and mentoring inside of the organization, look outside of the operation, uh, organization. So um, we have certainly not figured out everything, but I know that we all together as an industry together have certainly all tackled most of the issues that we are facing day to day. We just need to find the right person and link them with uh, our own teams to um, build we, whatever we, we need to build as our next step in our journey. Yeah. Yeah. Share the knowledge in you know, sessions like these, meetups, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And you also meetup and the knowledge sharing sessions inside the organization is something yeah. what yeah. We are cultivating really in a, in a high frequent manner. So we are doing a tech academy lunch and learn sessions and many, many, many other means where teams come together, share what did they learn, also what didn't work, how can they develop further, inviting external guests and uh, basically all together uh, sharing with the industry and uh, blocking around uh, what we are doing and uh, asking for basically feedback. How can we uh, all together reach next level? That's great. That's great. So. You have actually answered the next question about from Ralph about uh, <laughs> <laughs> sharing. So <laughs> we yeah. have it covered as well. Um, Very good. Okay. So thank you for now. Let's go. Yep. So we'll, we'll do another session uh, with questions from the audience later. So thank you, Marek. Uh, so um, talking about that um, talent acquisition and, and, you know, I noticed that you have um, a lot of open positions at Picnic also for your team and, and uh, you know, Picnic is growing fast. So how do you ensure uh, uh, to hire the best talent, you know, in addition to what you just said? Any advice for colleagues uh, here? Yeah. So hiring is, hiring is hard. Very simple. Everybody who is in the, uh, in the business of recruitment, it doesn't matter if it's a kind of a recruiter inside an organization or if it's a freelancer, uh, will know that finding the right talent is, is not easy. No. And if you talk to people from Google, Uber, Snap, they will tell you exactly the same. And uh, you should not make it easier, but you should cope with the, uh, let's say, with the difficulty of the, uh, of the hiring process. If you're looking uh, to how we, how we handle this in Picnic, uh, the first step of uh, is said we are have a very elaborate hiring process where we are in seven different kind of steps looking into is this candidate the right person for picnic from both the technical skills and from the team fit side and here with uh, both angles technical and the team fit side we are looking into uh, is he now a right fit and can he also be the right fit in a, in a couple of years time and if you're looking toward the potential going forward we are looking not only to can he develop person on a technical side, but can he evolve also uh, as a person uh, towards an uh, ever-changing environment. In a scale up, um, everything is changing every three to six months. So it's important that uh, everybody feels also comfortable that things are changing rapidly, uh, rapidly growing. Yeah. growing. And then uh, during the uh, different kind of hiring steps, we, we're actually asking our candidates 
to simulate the kind of different scenarios that we have in an organization. So that means we make pair of, um, we make whiteboards, we make uh, interviews, but uh, they are actually very close to a day-to-day -day operation in engineering. So therefore, everybody will know after the process is picnic something for him. We know is this an engineer that we can be happy in picnic, and altogether we have then a discussion with the candidate: Will he? Can he see himself in picnic mm -hmm. now in a couple of months and a couple of years time? Yeah, yeah. So spending a lot of time, investing a lot of time in, in purchase there. Yeah, very good. Um, so then they on board, and in this um, COVID time, it's 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 more complex to onboard people. So I guess you do that remote or semi-remote. Uh, any uh, learnings there? So we continue to, uh, to hire also during the COVID period. And uh, in this period, uh, things, obviously the processes had to change a bit. So interviews have been completely remote. Onboarding had to be completely remote. And the work uh, happened uh, completely uh, remote. Which means for us now, we uh, over the last six months or since March, we onboarded uh, quite a few engineers that in practice have never seen the office, but we are putting a lot of effort to make them part of the team. So that means we're setting them up for coffee chats, for discussions, for uh, bootcamp sessions with both their product team, but also with other team members, uh, joining always the lunch and uh, the, let's say the knowledge sharing session, and also encouraging them to share their experience on the onboarding journey. And obviously we, we also, hope to welcome them soon in Amsterdam. We love to work together at the same place, but if not, uh, we, we can still continue in this kind of remote way for, for quite, a, uh, quite a bit more time. Yeah, no, indeed. So completely other topic here, um, um, data analysis and, and learning from your data, what that's what I hear, you know, it's a big thing that uh, Picnic and the team, etc. I even saw a statement from you or in an interview, I, I guess, um, that said, your code is not done until you have analytics that support it. I found that, you know, it's, it's an interesting statement and maybe you can elaborate on that. So it's actually, um, so we are using a pretty data-centric approach, both on uh, all our business proposition, but also on the, uh, on the text proposition. So what it means for everything what we're building from the tech and the product side is that we are instrumenting our code by micrometer such that over Grafana as a dashboarding tool, we are uh, understanding exactly how the code works. So that means we can measure how many customers have used this feature. When did this feature work? When did this feature not work? Which customers are actually enjoying the feature? How much time do you spend on the page? How much time uh, do you spend on the checkout uh, page, et cetera, et cetera. So this is something where we are building now all new code since a couple of, uh, since a couple of let's say two or three years in a way that we have a detailed understanding of from an, from an observability angle, what this code is doing. So this is one angle and this is the kind of the product angle. On the other hand, on the engineering coding and implementation angle, we are using also a very data centric uh, approach and uh, have set up a broad tool set around a static code analysis. And for static code analysis, we are using Zona Group to fully understand the size, the complexity, complexity, the maintainability, the security, and the technical depth of code. And that is something what we are both monitoring and using also as steering metrics to improve the code uh, every day, every week uh, going forward. Yep, yeah. Um, skipping a few questions here um, because of time, but that's, that's uh, great um, because I want to keep some time open for questions from the audience. Um, so an, an interesting um, thing, if you measure um, so many items and um, are so focused on data, so did you uh, find a way to measure expected impact of a change in the software, for instance, versus the actual impact of a change? You know, predict before and yeah. after? In essence, every, so part of the world mapping, part of the, uh, the product road mapping and the product prioritization process, we build for every uh, single product feature an expectation on uh, basically two things. Number one is which kind of KPIs do we expect to be changed or to improve and which ones not. And the second one is then how much do we expect this uh, to be improved. And that is something what we make as part of the uh, micro business case before we already implement the feature. 
This is part of the decision metric where we decide which features we will actually prioritize for product in the console. After launch, we are reviewing uh, this expectation, uh, typically after two weeks, four weeks, and six weeks, depending a little bit on the product, but uh, usually after two, four, and six weeks for the consumer-facing products to measure the impact of each single feature with respect to the metrics as we expected. And we do this for two, uh, two reasons. Number one, we have a phase four of the product where we uh, launch features usually first to a small customer set and then step by step roll it out to, uh, to all customers. And based on if the, ex if the actual impact is as expected uh, before, then we just roll it out to all customers. Otherwise, we are uh, revising the feature. This is one thing. And the number two is we want to also get better of uh, predicting the impact of features. And that is a very, very important uh, learning that we had over the last kind of uh, two years uh, and uh, as a measuring organization. In the beginning, it is pretty simple. You're building the first version of a product. Everything is an improvement because you're building something from zero to one or you're solving basically large, large issues or challenges. Yeah. If you are becoming a, a larger organization, if you're becoming a more mature organization, then everything what you're doing on the product and on the business proposition side becomes more incremental. The improvements become uh, smaller. So therefore, it becomes more important that you have also better estimation of how, what is the impact. Very good, very good. So, so uh, if we um, um, talk about being ready for growth, and you know, no one could have predicted, of course, this current situation. And but you've faced uh, significant growth the last few years, um, um, and. Um, uh, as I said, many of your peers are uh, interested in being ready for uh, uh, for growth, uh, um, whatever event they will have. So, do you have ways of you know predicting uh, uh, growth to ensure that you're ready for it? Is there, do you have metrics that you're looking at? What's uh, what's your view now? Now there are, <clears throat> there are probably oh one second, give me a second. Okay, so I will do a, do a short bench or something now, I guess. <laughs> okay. it's, a, it's a lot of talk. Exactly, exactly, back in business. Sorry for that. <laughs> um, so coming back to the growth topic, um, so we are obviously um, planning our growth um, and we are making a planning for the next day, for the next week, next month, etc. Mm -hmm. For a couple of reasons. So the first reason is that we are, um, we are growing quickly and we need to align our business growth also with our physical growth. And physical growth means if we are actually serving 5% more orders, then we need 5% five, 5 more order pickers and 5% more, more runners, uh, so drivers on the street. So basically for the people in the staff plan, we need this. And the second angle is, if you do this planning, you need to make sure that your planning also happen. And what you learn over time is that in the beginning, uh, growth prediction is, is something what is relatively easy because you grow fast, you have more demands than you can actually uh, supply, so therefore, it's pretty easy to, uh, to, to, to make this, um, and this growth plans happen. With a specific size and increasing complexity, you need also, beside the growth planning, an actual growth, uh, growth operations. And growth operation means that you, as a team, that aligns all kinds of different stakeholders in your organization and all kinds of different units in your organization uh, to really make the growth as expected happen. So that means if you 5%, uh, if you go, if we go with 5%, you need to buy in more 5% products, you need to make uh, sure that you have 5% more orders uh, in, in the fulfillment center, etc. However, you need to also have 5% more for every single, <clears throat> and every single city, every single fulfillment center. And therefore, you need to also tailor the kind of the uh, advertising operation on a day, not only on a daily level, but on an hourly level, on a minute level. And that is what we call growth operations that became a bigger topic uh, as we grew. Interesting, Laura. Um, so, if you, what I also hear um, sometimes is, you know, um, uh, we're on the budget. 
So growth is coming, but I'm not sure I have the budget to support it and et cetera. So how do you convince your CEO to provide you with the right budget uh, to be ready to grow? So the budget uh, question itself is, um, is something which is a typical um, kind of a large scale corporate uh, topic. While if in a startup uh, world, you certainly make also budget planning and you also think a bit about uh, how can you grow your team. But if you are in an, um, if, if, if you're in a growth scale up mode, then uh, every engineer who joins your team works on features, works on topics that are significantly uh, more valuable and create more value than uh, the actual cost that would incur. So therefore, we have very little discussion about uh, actually, let's say on the tech side about uh, the budget topics. Our question is more about what are uh, the right topics to work on. And uh, in, an in a growing organization, uh, if you are creative, you should have significantly more ideas that you can realize. So for us, the reality for everybody in tech, for everybody in product, what they are doing on, uh, in our quarterly planning cycle is that uh, they are working together with the business teams on uh, the 10 times more feature ideas that they have for the, coming, uh, for the coming quarter and try to find out this small bucket of 10% that is really the most valuable one. And that is a process that um, is certainly not easy. And uh, that is a process that certainly also uh, requires quite a bit of effort, but it is a process worth doing because then uh, that is the way how you can really create most value for both customers, but also for the organization itself. Yeah, yeah. okay, thank you. So, so let's, um, Mark, if you, um, uh, I'm sure there are many questions uh, from the audience. Uh, maybe you can pick a few. Uh... Yeah, actually, the, uh, the most of the discussion is still about uh, the, the self, uh, uh, self-managed, self-organized teams, uh, which probably is the biggest, uh, biggest thing for all the CTOs that are hearing us, uh, <laughs> uh, because uh, this is this is something very interesting. Uh, so the uh, the first one uh, is uh, from Johan Stocking. Uh, it's how do you manage technical alignment across autonomous teams? Uh, meaning, uh, do you allow diverging, potentially leading to duplicate work, incompatibilities, even product team competition uh, in, this, in this kind of setup that you have? Yeah. So let me maybe add an, one additional flavor. Um, full out, also, we are not running fully autonomous, meaning that there is certainly also between the 15 product teams an alignment. And we have uh, actually a small team that is uh, working on this alignment across uh, different kind of um, different product teams, and uh, there is this is happening on two angles. Number one, there is a product alignment, or uh, there's a project alignment. So that means that there is one of uh, our key engineers is uh, is working on a day by day basis, aligning the kind of different uh, development and roadmap streams uh, between products. This is number one. And number two, there's also technical alignment, yeah. and the technical alignment is uh, something what uh, we are doing over the concept of an architecture working group, where basically every larger uh, development that we are doing inside of a product, but also cross product, um, it gets proposed here, where we make an upfront definition and description of, uh, of the architectural change, and then it goes uh, through a review process here. And uh, that is something which helps us to keep, on the one hand, the tech stacks across the different kind of product teams uh, aligned and also uh, lean, and on the other hand, also, uh, keeps uh, uh, ensures that we are building the best possible architecture for such a solution. Our design principle in the beginning, maybe to add one last uh, thought here, is that we didn't go uh, too fancy on our tech stack. Our tech stack was uh, was Java, and that was it. And then there was a little bit of Spring, and then there's Elastic, and there's a Mongo, and there's a Postgres. But actually, that is not too fancy. We didn't go into a uh, Scala, or we didn't go in Closure. We didn't go, go into Go or Rust, uh, but we, we tried to stay as much as possible in a well-established languages and, and, and frameworks. And that has helped us quite a bit to uh, keep also to focus on engineering principles instead of uh, understanding how to do in a kind of a new language paradigm to support uh, a specific uh, feature. Okay. Uh, and who is actually making the decisions about the uh, the tech stack? Uh, so this is 
so this is a, this is a decision that we are doing uh, collaborative, uh, collaboratively with uh, the group of uh, tech leads. So this is a group uh, currently of uh, 12 uh, technical leaders. Typically these are pro uh, leaders for uh, the different kind of technical products. And uh, we are meeting once per week. Uh, we are also have a smaller group, which is um, the architecture working group. And uh, every kind of bigger technical decision gets proposed here and will we'll get, uh, we'll get reviewed here and then typically done. And that is, uh, that is something what uh, has worked pretty well so far. And uh, I'm encouraging, we are encouraging even further that uh, teams are uh, staying bold on the uh, technologies that they experiment with. If a new technology gets experimented with in a kind of a local product, then uh, we would lo we love to uh, let's say experiment with the technology. How there's only one requirement. Whenever you have a result and insights on how it works with your product, you share afterwards the insights with everybody, and then we can together decide do we want to roll it out uh, across the other products or do we keep it as a local experiment? And that is roughly uh, how we, for instance, started with a reactive programming. It started with one, pro, uh, one product uh, as a small experiment um, uh, over a pizza session. And then uh, step by step, it moved uh, into the other products up to the point where we have now a guild that is championing uh, all the uh, usage of Eric's Java and the reactor across uh, basically all products in Picnic. Nice. Yeah, nice. Uh, okay, then the, uh, Ralph is uh, asking. Well, assuming that uh, assuming that you are working in sprints because you haven't thought that, uh, but the, but this is like a very uh, very common question in uh, in uh, in IT world. Uh, so so I ask it. Uh, how how do you approach it? Uh, so the teams are responsible for the releases and incidents, and how do you protect the sprint goal with this distraction? So um, we are basically running, a, we are leaving it up to uh, our product teams if they are using either Scrum or Kanban. Uh, now we have a couple of, most of the teams are using uh, a Kanban style of development. Uh, some teams are using a, a Scrum uh, process and the product owner itself together with the tech lead defines uh, the scope of the sprint and then uh, they are making sure that uh, they can stay as much as possible on uh, on the actual uh, scope of the sprint and of the, uh, that the uh, deliver on what they plan to do, deliver in the sprint. However, we are not religious on the, on the deliverable of a, of a sprint. If there is something more, uh, more valuable and more important popping up and if there is alignment between uh, the business stakeholders and technical stakeholders, obviously we will do it. There's only one driving factor, what can create value for customers and what can create value for, for our tech stack. If there is something what is uh, just creating a value more on both angles, then we certainly will do it. So that, that's uh, an, an interesting um, question here for you, so I will uh, uh, pay, uh, place it, but then leave it with that. Uh, so. Um, uh, Anna is asking, at Air France KLM, we are transforming our architecture organization. Would you be interested in the call to benchmark? <laughs> you might uh, want to take that separately, but... Uh, <laughs> it's take it offline. <laughs> yes, correct. People, uh, people find it interesting. That's good to hear. So thank you, Marek. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll do another uh, session with questions in a minute. So um, on the international part, um, um, so you, you went a few years ago when you started in Germany, obviously uh, you have some uh, experience there <laughs> firsthand, I guess. Um, so many companies want to go international with also, you know, growth and how do you handle that? So what were your biggest learnings for your team when you opened Germany a few years ago? So there are probably three learnings that really have um, you find the way how we uh, how we are now have organized us after we launched in, in Germany in 2018. So the first thing is, if you want to go international, you need to think carefully about how do you organize a product and tech in an environment where you are operating in multiple countries, potentially multiple time zones across uh, different kind of languages, across uh, different kind of uh, currencies, and whatever kind of uh, mm -hmm. differences you you may have. So what, one thing about um, one of the design principles that we have applied and that we want to stick to for as long as possible is that we keep all tech and product development um, central. And that means that every product, uh, every of our uh, 50 products is deployed both in uh, both countries and uh, hopefully soon uh, more 
um, in both countries in exactly the same way. And there's obviously a, sl a slight differences. Just think about the payment solution. You mm -hmm. have different payment methods in Germany versus in the Netherlands. But essentially, it's the same product. It's the same version and the same way how you operate it, sir. So while you're on the business side, typically uh, differentiating, so you have the German marketing team and you have the Dutch marketing team. On the tech side, we are trying to keep everything uh, uh, together. The second angle is we have started to think very conceptually about how do you uh, how do we scale not only from one to two but one to n. So in yeah. essence, for us, the step to go in the second country was um, this is now country two, but what do we do if it's country three? four, five, ten, hundred. So in essence, the way how we wanted to set up and how we have set up the systems is that there is no difference between going from one to a, say a second country or now the, uh, to a hundred different other countries. And the third angle is obviously uh, thinking a bit about how can we centralize uh, a monitoring infrastructure while we have a decentralized uh, kind of deployments. So for the technical deployment for our operation in Germany is technically separate uh, from our Dutch deployment. So this is one of the design principles for, for various reasons. But uh, the monitoring uh, and the alerting and uh, the entire incident management uh, process, we want to keep uh, central. And then the question is, how far can you scale with such a uh, kind of centralized structure? And the, but all, all these are kind of the three design principles that we have applied while going international. And that, uh, and that is a model that allows us to go to quite a few more countries. Yeah, yeah interesting. So, so uh, we're um, getting towards the end uh, already. So um, a few questions um, at, at the end, then we will go back to the uh, to the audience again. So, um, if you could travel in time, uh, we all would like to do that, of course. Uh, what would you advise a younger Daniel? That's an interesting question, huh? which I always struggle a little bit on uh, how to uh, how to find a good answer. Um, we um, we have experimented with a lot of things, and uh, I believe that in many many cases, uh, myself, but also our entire technical and the business leadership teams have done uh, to a large extent the best decisions that we could and that we knew to do at this point in time. One thing what I would like to advise uh, to myself, and uh, basically that is advice I would like to give to everybody here is most decisions, when assuming that they are not fatal and uh, completely wrong, are usually too late. So I think uh, the most, most decisions we should have done a little bit earlier, meaning, for instance, thinking about organizational skills, thinking about a systematic learning and development, and system, systematic uh, brand building, systematic knowledge sharing, and all those kind of topics that are pretty obvious in hindsight, uh, which are not so obvious in the, at, at some point, are usually postponed for a little bit too long. And then uh, usually they are done at a point where it becomes painful, and uh, that is something that can be relatively easy avoided if you do this a bit earlier in the timeline. And that is something what I would like to uh, give myself as an advice to do it uh, uh, a little bit earlier in the journey. Yeah, good advice. And so you would say it's better to make a, uh, you know, a not completely baked uh, decision uh, faster than uh, rethink and rethink and rethink uh, and make it later. Most most kind of uh, most startups fail not because they do a wrong decision, but they do the wrong decision too late. Yeah. yeah. Doing a wrong decision and then uh, just pivoting to the right decision which is, by the way, what we did in Picnic, and this is something what uh, basically all startups are doing, uh, is something which is perfectly fine, and everybody should, uh, should be encouraged. There's a very nice quote from one of the LinkedIn founders, which says, you're not embarrassed by the first version of your product you have released too late. And there are many kind of uh, variants of this, yeah. but this is something what I would encourage both every uh, product leader, but also every tech leader, uh, just iterate as fast as you can over your tech stack, Usually, uh, the biggest mistake that you can do is that you are too late uh, with the technical decision. Yeah, yeah, no, I can imagine that. Thank you. So, um, before we go to the questions from the audience um, again, I um, um, would like to talk about for, mi for a minute about the CTO roundtable sessions. So, we are organizing them every month and we rotate the panel based on topic. Normally, we have two or three uh, people. This is a very special case, of course. Um, and 
um, if you want to see specific topics discussed or want to be on the panel, please let me know. I mean, uh, that would be great. Send me an email. Uh, um, so next time is the 22nd of September, um, Boost Motivation in Remote Development Teams. Very uh, current topic, I would say. Yafo uh, Philippens, um, Head of Engineering at TicketSwap, will join me. And we would like to add um, other tech leaders to the panel. So uh, please reach out to me if you would like to join Yafo in, uh, in that session. That would be great. Um, and we also would appreciate your feedback on this uh, on these sessions so that we can improve further. So just send me an email with your thoughts and um, and that's it. So uh, here's my email, here's my LinkedIn uh, if you want to connect. Um, but so let's go, um, Marek, back to uh, the question and close this up. Okay, so it's Yahoo. Uh, so I pronounce it Yahoo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay. Uh, so the the first question is uh, another very nice name, uh, Partha <laughs> Sarati uh, asks: uh, Is picnic built in the on the cloud? Which is probably obvious, but uh, if yes, how do you choose a cloud provider or choose to stay cloud agnostic? These are actually two questions. So, um, so the first question is very simple. Uh, indeed, we are completely uh, built in the cloud. So. Very early on, we had a very simple, uh, let's say, tech decision or uh, philosophy. We want to build absolutely everything in the cloud, no physical on-site infrastructure. So if you come to one of our offices, uh, then the only thing that you will find here is a lot of kind of uh, excited uh, engineers and geeks, uh, and then uh, laptops or uh, desktops uh, that are connected to the cloud services. Since, by the way, uh, since we hired a lawyer uh, a couple of uh, two years back, we have now also printer, but it's the only physical infrastructure. Um, if we are talking about the selection of, an, um, of a cloud vendor, then uh, we worked for quite a few years with AWS, and now we are completely deployed on AWS. We have also, also a little bit of infrastructure running on Google and on, uh, on Azure, but to a large extent, we are uh, AWS uh, based. We are using, uh, to a large extent, the basic services, let's say cloud compute uh, and storage, which can be, uh, without too much effort, uh, migrated to another cloud provider in the same way also with Kubernetes and Terraform type of abstraction. Uh, that is something where um, there's less effort to, uh, to become cloud agnostic. However, uh, cloud agnosticity, I hear more often from the engineering world, but in practice, if you think a bit about how big are cloud providers these days yeah. is something which I wouldn't worry too much um, in, uh, as, as a tech leader. And uh, I would just pick one which you feel most comfortable with and then uh, you basically go all in there. You can, these days you can't make really a big uh, mistake because all kind of major cloud vendors are roughly on a similar level. Mark, any more questions? I think uh, okay, so the second one is more about the scaling up uh, on the short notice. So I think that the cloud solves that. And uh, but there is another interesting one from Rainier. Um, uh, uh, through the COVID spike, which processes need to change in the physical warehouse? Uh, like uh, apart from the technology, you probably uh, have been struggling also some physical uh, problems like supply chain and things like that, right? And uh, uh, okay. So this is actually a very good question. So was we um, all kind of out of scaling functionalities from uh, the public cloud vendors, in, for instance, in this case now AWS, are not strong enough to cope with this kind of massive uh, uh, demand spikes. So you need to really build all kind of uh, manual uh, functionalities uh, to really cope with this, uh, this demand. But beside that, um, in the physical world, we had, uh, we had two interesting challenges. Number one is, we had a lot of customers that wanted to shop with us. Number two, uh, we were embedded in, in, uh, in, in a food delivery or food supplier ecosystem that was seriously challenged. So that means why there were much more customers that wanted to shop with us, all kind of suppliers had difficulties to uh, deliver uh, in the right quantity on time, etc. And then, uh, all kind of warehouse where the warehouse capacity is driven by uh, the number of people that can work in a, in a safe way in such a warehouse. If you need to operate in a one and a half meter uh, 
way of uh, distance uh, way of working. Then obviously also the entire capacity of the warehouse is affected. So we had basically two challenges. Number one is more demand, less supply, and then uh, making everybody happy. So uh, we, we took all kinds of different measures that we can work in a safe way uh, in the warehouses to get uh, also help our uh, suppliers uh, to, uh, to deliver the right quantity, the right time uh, to us, uh, to give them earlier forecasting, to help them to deliver at the different kind of moments uh, that makes, uh, makes it easier for them to deliver, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, additionally, we also took all kinds of measures in the warehouses uh, that everybody uh, stayed safe in, uh, yeah. the way how, uh, um, how everybody felt, uh, felt safe. So unfortunately it's seven o'clock and uh, we have a lot of questions open and we'll try to get uh, back to it after the, the call, but um, not to spend so much time from everyone that we didn't book. So thank you again, Daniel. Um, and um, we cannot physically give you a gift now, what you normally would do. Uh, I sent you a gift that should have hit your inbox uh, a few minutes ago. So uh, hope you enjoy it and, and thanks again. And um, um, with this, we'll end the CTO roundtable session and hope to see you all next time, 22nd of September. Thanks, Gerbert. Uh, thanks, Marek. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining in. Loved it. Hope to see you all soon. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.